Without further ado, I would like to introduce everyone to Dr. Jensen. It's, again, very exciting to have him here today. He's a former teacher who grew up in San Diego, California. His BA is in English. His master's is in organizational development, and his PhD is in human development. For over two, two decades, he has synthesized brain research and developed practical applications for educators. Uh, Dr. Jensen has authored over 28 books, including Teaching with Poverty in Mind, Tools for Engagement, Engaging Students with Poverty in Mind, Turnaround Tools for the Teenage Brain, and, and Different Brains, Different Learners. Jensen is a member of the Invitation Only Society for Neuroscience, the President's Club at Salt Institute of Biological Studies, and the New York Academy of Sciences. He co-founded the first and largest brain-compatible academic enrichment program now held in 16 countries with over 55,000 graduates. Today, Dr. Jensen also provides in-depth trainings that can be found at jensenlearning.com. Please help me welcome Dr. Eric Jensen. Well, thank you very much, Carrie, and it's so exciting to be here. We've got lots to do, so let's roll up our sleeves and get started. First things first, a uh, quick overview of what we're going to do. We're going to understand how do you create the relationships with struggling students. Secondly, part of going after succeeding with struggling students is learning how to be able to hear what people are not saying. Sometimes it looks like there's one problem you're solving, but it's really a different problem. So learning to understand the real problem. Learning what kind of expectations are realistic with a struggling student. How do you build cognitive capacity? How do you teach grittiness, social emotional skills, and how do you become a coach for them to be successful in life? I've worked with many underperforming students, and you could come up with a different list of seven, but I love this list, so let's get started. First, let's find out where you are at working with your own students. I'll give you three choices. They're up on the screen. First one, I'm overwhelmed, too many students, not enough time. In the middle, I'm feeling fine, all things considered. And at the bottom, I'm pretty energized and excited about the growth I'm already seeing. Go ahead, use your cursor and click on the button that most is where you're at at the moment. Go ahead, begin, please. We'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Good. Looks like just about everybody's got their uh, response already plugged in. So we like to find out where you're at for lots of good reasons. One is it helps me do a better job for you. So when we check out where we're going with this, we see about one in five are already pretty excited. And the remaining are either saying, I'm doing fine or I'm overwhelmed, so about 38, 39% are feeling pretty overwhelmed. So that helps a lot. So thank you very much for taking care of that. One suggestion I would make is every time you begin working with your students is that you always ask yourself, what's the posture in? What's the metabolic state? In other words, how are they feeling at the moment? You and I know when we feel tired, when we feel grumpy, we aren't very excited or responsive about what's coming up next. At the end of a long day of work, sometimes you and I would go, oh, I don't feel like going out tonight. But when you're psyched up about it, it's different. First activity I would always offer to your struggling students is to learn the attitude of gratitude and the skills of optimism. So ask them to find a partner and partner up and do an activity like this. By the way, if you are with another person at this moment, this will be your assignment. If you're by yourself, please write down the answers to these two questions in 10 words or less. Ready, get set, go. You have 30 seconds. Wrap it up, please. Good. Now pause for a moment. 
if you did this with your students just once or twice, it would probably be treated by their brain as sort of a novelty, like, oh, okay, I did it. But you won't get any lasting change in the brain. The mantra you're going to hear over and over from me is this. Steady consistency that pushes the envelope are going to get your changes, meaning it's got to be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit hard, but every single day keep pushing, keep pushing. So this for your students should be a hard thing for them to do which means you're going to need to create a little bit of buy-in before you ask them to do that. You'll need to give them some ideas for it because initially they just won't have the mindset, they won't have the ideas, they won't have the thoughts, and they won't even know how to verbalize it or what to write down. You know differently. So write this down in your notes. Get my students in a good state, S-T-A-T-E, a good state for learning. Get my students in a good state for learning. So how you can do that is get them up and move them around, a quick energizer. I like to have students be the ones that generate it. And something like this lets them start to get into a better thinking frame of mind. Now that they're ready to learn, life is good because you're going to get better results. Oh, by the way, at the end of this webinar, I'll ask you for your ABC idea, something you agree with, buy into, and willing to commit to. Several times during the session, I'll be using effect sizes. Most of you know what effect sizes are. And if you didn't know, an effect size is simply the gain that is made when you try out an intervention compared to a control group where there is no intervention. So the gain might be 0.50, which would be half of a full standard deviation. By the way, 0.50 would be the equivalent of about one year of academic progress in school. So if a student is struggling, we can assume they're getting less than one year's worth of gains for every year that they're in school. So our goal is to always exceed that. We want effect sizes between 0.50 and as high up as 0.20. So smaller the number, the less the effect size. There are other ways to be able to measure the effects of what you, you do, and this is just one of them, but it's an important one. So let's begin with relationships and how important they are. You and I know that most students care more about if you care about them than the knowledge of your content. So what are things you can do to kind of bump this up? First of all, many of the students that struggle have been let down by adults, so they've lost hope. Many feel alone. They don't have a partner, a brother, a sister, a parent. Many have been misdiagnosed, meaning people have thought the wrong thing was the problem. What students need is an ally, a go-to adult. You become that person. So this means starting and building relationships has to be number one or else they're not going to even go to the next stage. So how do you actually do that? There's many ways. Start with simple things. Do you call them by name? Do you notice when they come and go? Do you ask them, could you use someone to listen just for a few moments? Do you know their hobbies and do you know about what their challenges are? Do you also, when we talk about relationships, do you also do know the research on it? Many people hear that relationships are important, and then they go, yeah, 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 heard that before. Actually, good relationships diffuse stress. Good relationships provide hope. So that's important to you because without the good relationships, not much good is going to happen. When you make eye contact with your students, do you, and they contribute something, do you say thank you with eye contact? Do you smile at them? I had a person in one of my trainings stay at the end of the training, and she sat near the front row, and she said, can I talk to you about something for a second? And everyone had left the room. And I said, of course, what is it? And she said, I get the feeling that you don't like me. And she said, when you looked towards me, you didn't acknowledge or smile or anything. And I realized this was amazing feedback for me, and I felt terrible, and I went, wow. 
everybody notices? The answer was no, I didn't have any dislike of her, but this shows you how perceptive people can be. So make sure, see, you know their family situation and visit their neighborhood. So these are all the beginnings of building the relationships that you want. Never blow it off. To students, these are a big deal. The effect size, 0.72, which is almost a year and a half worth of gains. Remember, they'll work harder for you when they know you're on their side. Next, reminder about relationships. Sometimes you forget how much they care about you and would like to care about you. <clears throat> That's why the first one on the list says share something personal about yourself once a week for the whole year. Do a favor at the beginning of the year that's so strong that people remember it. Do listening for a couple minutes a day. Make it a goal. Learn three things for 30 weeks of the year about a student other than their name. These are the kinds of things that you can use to build up your own relationship skills for those of you that don't already have that. So first on our list is build the relationships. And as I said, without those, nothing is going to work. The students, they're everything. When they come to school every day, here's their question. Are you on my side or not? Are you a friend or foe? Are you an ally or adversary? And they have to feel it that you are an ally. Understanding the real problem is the second key point. So here's a student for you. A male, eight years old, he seems kind of scattered and impulsive. He forgets a lot of what he hears when teachers ask the student to get organized. He fools around in class. He's unable to predict the next sequence of tasks. He doesn't reflect on his behaviors. His older brother has many of the same symptoms, and they both came from poverty. The teacher's pretty sure that he has what? What would you fill in the blanks? Like, what's your diagnosis? Go ahead, write down your answer, or if you're with another person, share your answer. So many teachers would have written down ADHD or ADD. What you should know is that for a lot of students who have these kinds of symptoms, it's really important to remember that it's easy to label someone, but unless you actually are a medical doctor or a psychiatrist, you might get surprised by it. Here you're looking at a healthy version of the brain. Actually, this is my own brain scan and you're seeing four different views of it. The bottom is in the upper left-hand corner, and then the right hemisphere is in the top right, left hemisphere, lower left, and then the top of the brain in the right. Here's what you should know. This brain looks like it's pretty healthy because smooth surface shows even activation and the brain is humming along. Now check out the same brain when they are stressing me out like crazy. What you now see is my brain doesn't look so good. This is actually very similar to what you'd see in a student who has serious ADHD. But what I'm telling you is all of this happened from stress. So let's go back to the student we introduced. Possibilities for this student include if he grew up poor, it means greater likelihood of increased chronic stress disorders. Stress disorders mimic the exact same symptoms of ADHD, impulsivity, poor memory, and a chronica, which is a Greek word for mean out of sync with time. But as long as he keeps being labeled as ADHD, he'll never get the interventions that he needs. Now, second thing, let's try another student. This guy is 15 years old. He's acting out a lot in school, behavior problems. His grades have dropped in the last year. He seems angry, depressed. Several times he's lashed out at teachers for small things. Not doing homework anymore. Some teachers think he maybe is oppositional. Others think it's ADHD. Motivation is gone. Write down in your notes, what do you think might be going on with this student? All 
right, let's check in. First thing you should know is that things like this are a serious flag, a serious signal. What the information suggested is that this started recently. It happened within the last year or so. So something happened. What could have happened in his brain? Well, let's check in. If there was any type of a head injury, what you're looking at is a top-down view of tissue. And at the top right, you'll see a blow-up of smooth tissue. These are the axons that come out from the cell bodies. That's the outbound signaling. And at the top, you see it torn. Like you'll see these gaps at the top right compared to at the bottom where it's not torn. What's the relevance of this? When someone gets a concussion or head injury or brain trauma, there's usually tearing in the brain, and the tearing compromises the cognitive and emotional systems. When you scan the brain, you might see this type of differences in the brain when we're looking using a SPECT scan, which is single positron emitted computed tomography, which is more of a generalized view of brain activity. You'll see brain trauma injuries looking like this, or in this case, a student who literally fell out of a tree when he was very young, you see a big hole in the brain where there's no activity right there. These are the kinds of things you have to consider even though you can't see them. So when we go to possibilities, one possibility for this student is with the symptoms we see is maybe the boy's father left the marriage. You'll get a different effect if the boy's father left the marriage than the mother or the father may have been hospitalized long-term or was killed. In other words, huge male absence. The boy is depressed and in grieving. Middle case, maybe he moved away from where he had a close-knit relationship, close friends. Maybe he lost his girlfriend over the move. Or finally, the boy experienced a kind of physical trauma. Unless you build the relationships with students, you'll never get them to tell you what went on. Almost guaranteed these would be one of my top three. Almost guaranteed, like 90% chance it's one of these three. So let's check out one more. What's the real problem? A girl's seven years old, she reads a paragraph, and the teacher asks her what she read, she has no idea. Teacher responds, read it again, but this time I want you to pay attention. Later, when the teacher gives the same student two numbers to calculate in her head mentally, like here's four, now multiply that by five, this girl's unable to do it in spite of being taught it over and over. The teacher repeats the task and tells the girl to pay attention this time. Go ahead and write down what you think is the problem. Now let's check out some possibilities. First thing on my list is that we can tell she's paying attention, but the highest likelihood that I would predict is she has terrible working memory. In other words, stuff goes in her head and it falls out of her head. It could have happened from a traumatic brain injury, TBI, but it could also be that she's grown up in poverty and is experiencing chronic stress. Those two would be my highest likelihood, working memory. So here's what this is about. Before you decide what's wrong with a student, you build relationship. The second thing you have to do is understand what the real problem is. Many times kids get moved on year after year, kicked down the road, because what happens is teachers misdiagnose. They misdiagnose, they misdiagnose. Why? Because they get a cookie cutter and they want every student to fit that cookie cutter. Watch how they cope with classroom assignments. Check details from not one but multiple test scores. You want to find out did their test scores suddenly change or they eroded over time or were they low from the get-go? Listen to stories about his or her last 10 years. Have they moved a lot? Are they in a military family? Was there a family trauma? Was there losses? Do they, are they growing up in poverty? Until you get the real story, 
you'll never be able to solve the student's struggling issues. Please put a big star by this. This is an important piece of the puzzle. In other words, make sure you go after the real problem. Now, once you think you have the real problem, then the next stage would be, what should I expect now that I know the real problem? Like, what should I expect knowing that the student has lost a father or the girl has terrible working memory or the student grew up in poverty? What should I expect? Well, the first thing to understand is that DNA is not our destiny. When they don't arrive at school with their DNA pre-assembled, throw that out. DNA contributes a portion of how we turn out, but not 100%. And why is that? It's because environment can influence whether genes are activated or suppressed. And this is this new science of epigenetics, E-P-I-G-E-N-E-T-I-C-X. So epigenetics means that the environment influences whether genes are acting the way we expect them to behave. So they get glued together by life experiences. So here's a student, it's actually a real person, Alonzo Clemens suffered brain damage as a result of a fall as a child. In school, he could not read, write, nor do math. IQ 40 to 50, unable to tie his own shoes or eat by himself. So if he was a student that came to you or in your class, what kind of expectations should you have for him? What goals would you have set for him? What, what, what questions would you ask of this student? So write down goals or expectations. If you have someone with you, go ahead and talk over what would you expect. All right, pause for a moment. I never had a student like this, and I don't know what I would have done. Today, I'm different, but at that time, I don't know if I would have kept expectations high. Because when you see someone that almost sits there like a vegetable, you're thinking, oh boy, I got my work cut out for me. Now, you might be one who works with special needs students, and you see students like this often. But I know just for myself, I would have had a tough time setting high expectations. And that would have been a big, big mistake. Because would you really have expected this student to become rich, famous, and be in the Olympics and be on the Discovery Channel in 60 minutes? Because that's exactly how his life turned out. Read the next slide. By the way, you can buy the sculptures that he does, and they are at his website, longzoclemens.com. His sculptures sell all over the world. He has an uncanny ability to be able to sculpt with his hands. And the reason I bring this up is because you should know the million-dollar question to ask students when you have students who are struggling. This is the question that a savvy teacher would ask. What do you like to do? You see, Alonzo Clemens, what he liked to do is work with his hands. What he liked to do is make things. Give him a piece of clay, and he could do a sculpture. That was the million-dollar question. When a teacher asked that and he showed what he could do, everything changed. His whole life changed. Never, ever think you should set low expectations. Ask the student, what do you like to do? So how do you boost high expectations or build them. One is show students other students. Show them this is what other kids your age do. And when you work with other students, here's a good chance that they are a good prediction. They don't go home at night and Google the phrase high-performing adolescence. They don't Google that. You be the one that shows up and shows them what students can do that's amazing. Up at the top of the screen is Dylan Mallingham, 
who by age nine was speaking in front of the United Nations, and he has 24,000 student volunteers around the world. Or Alexandra Scott that raised over a million dollars for brain research. Or Katie Stagliano that started up a company called Katie's Crops because of an idea she got when she's 12 years old by donating vegetables to the homeless. What were you doing at age 9, age 4, age 12? This is what adolescents can do around the world. The reason this is important to ask is because your mindset has to be, listen, brains can change. Change can be for the worse on the left-hand side of the screen. We call it maladaptive. Or they can be for the better on the right, adaptive, such as skills training or enrichment. Those are positive changes using what we call neuroplasticity. So understanding that the brain can change is powerful. In this study, the pre and the post exams were using MRIs. So as you know, an MRI is a soft tissue x-ray of the brain. What the MRI showed is that by reading, it was altering the brain. It actually strengthened and enlarged pathways in the brain, in the axon tissues. In this case, the student on the far left had in this pre-fMRI, which is active imaging, top-down view, had activity in the wrong places of the brain to do well. But 12 weeks later, after the fast-forward program, you see that his brain was altered and the student became a decent reader. And that's powerful because it only took a short amount of time. And now his brain's using a different part of his brain. That's pretty impressive. And teaching vocabulary to students. Scientists not just found where vocabulary shows up in the brain, but they found that increased vocabulary added gray matter density, and increased gray matter density increased, and it was correlated with higher test scores. Bottom line is, brains can change, and they can change cognitively. So the old myth is that when you have a struggling student, that their IQ is what their IQ is going to be. Throw that out. That's old. That's not current science. In this study, 65 low-income children, low socioeconomic status children, were adopted between ages 4 and 6. All of them had an IQ, a full standard deviation, below what would be considered typical before adoption. Eight years later, they were retested. The average gain was about 14 IQ points. In other words, IQ is not fixed. It can be raised through enriching environment. Core understanding here is a critical one. When you have others around you that think student achievement is mostly due to luck or it's due to genes, that's not true. The circumstances around them and the teaching actually turns out to be a big deal. But what about the genes? It turns out that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Sorry about that. It turns out that if you are middle class or upper class, the genetic heritability in you of the IQ of your parents is high. 60 to 80 percent likelihood it's going to happen. But if your parents are poor, the heritability of IQ is low. It's under 10 percent. What does this actually mean at your school with a struggling student? It means you can't have any teacher say, well, I know just how this kid's going to turn out. I taught his daddy 20 years ago, and he wasn't very bright. Actually, if the student is poor, you don't know much at all. The heritability of the IQ is very low. I emailed the researchers to make sure I understood the study correctly, as I often do, and they said the same thing I was thinking. I was thinking... You can't get a good read on a student's IQ if the student comes from poverty, on the heritability of the IQ. So what does this actually mean? It means that anybody at your school that is pointing fingers and saying, it's, we can't change him, it can't be done, you can't do it, that mindset is a terrible mindset. You want to have the no excuses mindset. Anybody can point fingers at other things like, oh, the last teacher, oh, this, oh, that. But four-year-olds point fingers. You be the one that says, what can we do? After all, DNA is not your destiny. 
So our first three things we started with, our relationship building is critical. Otherwise, students won't open up and tell you so that you can find out. The second one is what's the real problem. Third, you want to build the mindsets, the mindsets that say, okay, how am I going to go into this with a positive attitude? Number four in our list is building cognitive capacity. This has to be a relentless one. Now, the cognitive capacity is really the sum of all of the mental actions in one's brain, and it is, of course, correlated with enhanced learning and achievement. Examples of cognitive capacity tools would include mental skills, mental skills like, for example, processing, attentional focus, and memory, and so forth. These are core mental skills. When students have these skills, they do pretty well in school. So the effect sizes of these cognitive skills, I shared with you relationship skills have a high effect size of a year and a half. Check out the numbers on this slide. You start building auditory language strategies like the way Fast Forward does. The effect size is over two years' worth of gains, teaching them problem solving, memory, graphic organizers, similarities, differences, and working memory training. These are crazy high effect sizes. That's why you want to be building cognitive skills with your students. Another thing that you might be interested in trying to decide which cognitive skills you want to build, if you ask the question, how are students different based on socioeconomic status? So on the far left, you see a really tall bar, the brown one. We're looking at differences between middle class students and those from poverty. And the bigger the bar, the bigger the effect size. Notice the ones where the arrows are pointing to. The biggest effect sizes are in brain areas of language and memory. Most teachers understand the language, but they don't know that memory is actually number two. So teach students simple peg systems, meaning hooks, like, for example, one is the sun, you know, two is uh, a shoe, or three is a tricycle because there's three wheels on it. Teach a simple peg system to kids so they can start memorizing things. You think you shouldn't teach memorizing. That's a huge mistake, and I just showed you why. For one, memorizing gives students confidence. Second, it reduces the cognitive load, meaning instead of having to hold it, everything in their head the first time, they already have a cue to attach it to. Now, there are plenty of different memory types. You have long-term memory, you've got short-term memory, you've got working memory. So quick quiz for you. Please check this quiz out that you see up on the screen. Which school-based factor, when tested at age five, actually predicts academic success even better than IQ? Go ahead, pick your answer. By the way, if you picked B or D, those are pretty good answers, but the correct one is E for working memory. Working memory actually is a better predictor than IQ. So how would you teach working memory? There are many ways to do it. I'm going to share with you a couple quick things. First of all, if you would, please repeat this sound out loud. I know we're distance separated, but repeat the sound out loud. Da-da-da-da-da-da. Great. Now, by you doing that, was that an example of you using working memory, yes or no? Answer is no. That's short-term memory, short-term auditory memory. So working memory would be reassembling things in your head. For example, if I gave you three letters, such as B, C, A, and I said rearrange those in your head to make a word out of it. B, C, A, hopefully you came up with the word cab, C-A-B. So that's an example of using working memory. In your brain, working memory only stores sounds and images. Doesn't sound smells, touch, or other sensations. 
So in the classroom, students that can store sounds and images do better in school. Why? Working memory is a driver of cognition. It's required for every higher order thinking process. Kids in poverty have weaker working memory, and this is a teachable skill. What's the effect size of working memory? First of all, at the K-5 level, the effect size is 1.41. The secondary level, the average effect size is about 1.0, which is about two years' worth of gains. In other words, the effect size is huge. So here are some keys to remember when you teach working memory skills. First, make sure you get buy-in. Second, make sure you get a pre and a post, and make sure you tie this into meaningful goals that you have in the classroom, like tie it into reading skills, vocabulary, or math skills, and make sure you have an evidence path. Do this with interdependency, meaning either with a computer program or with another student partner. Make it easy to start off so there's a quick initial learning curve. Make sure it keeps getting harder and harder. Make sure there's good quality feedback so they know how they're doing. And if you're teaching this yourself, 10 to 14 minutes a day over a period of two to three months, and you'll see great gains in working memory. So what are the kinds of things you would do with struggling students? If you are starting off and doing numbers, by the way, you can do all kinds of things. The more your students struggle, the lower the grade levels, the simpler you start off. For example, with younger students, start off with objects. These could be objects that they have a picture of, or you write down the word lock, or a picture of a hammer, or eyeglasses, or a key. In other words, anything that's an object, ask students now, is that object closer to your right hand or your left hand? so they can start to visualize it, then say close your eyes with your eyes closed. Is that object now closer to your left or your right? Now move the object over to the other side. Now which is it closer to your left hand or right hand? In other words, with struggling students, you'll have to teach them how to visualize. Then teach them how to do this with pictures. So the pictures might be Okay, the, what's in front of you? And you could have, them have a duck and a dog and say, now close your eyes. What do you see in front of you? What are the two things? Name them. Good. Now switch the order of them. So now the duck's on the right and the dog's on the left. You get the idea until pretty soon you can add a banana to the group and pretty soon you can add an orange to the group. The bottom line is start where kids are at and slowly build till they can do these with 100% over and over and over. If you're going to work primarily with numbers, and by the way, you'll want to pick whether you're going to stay with numbers to build math skills or stay with words to build um, language skills. Don't do both because it, those are different pathways in your brain. Do one one year, one another year. So if you're going to do numbers, you might ask them, to say these numbers forward and then say them in reverse. They can do that while they're seeing it or while they're hearing it, but don't let them stare at the answers. So they'll give these two numbers. You say to them out loud, three, six, and then they say to you, three, six, and then they say, six, three. That's using working memory. Repeating it is simply short-term memory. You say 3-6 and they say 3-6, that's short-term auditory memory. But if you say 3-6, now say it backwards, they'd have to figure out, okay, what was first and what was last. Once they can do 20 pairs in a row at 100%, you know that you can do more. So these are the kinds of things that you can do with your students. Repeat them forward, then they say them in reverse order. So over time, they'll be able to do other things, like do them from smallest to greatest, not just reverse order, but smallest to greatest. Then when you switch over to ought to language systems, you can do things like this. You say the word to your students out loud, do, as in do this or do that. Ask them to spell that out loud, and they say D-O, great, you say. Now, spell it backwards. 
And they, in order to do that, they have to visualize it or they're going to take their hands and spell it out in front on their hands. That's the beginning of learning to visualize words. Pretty soon, they'll be able to visualize words like the word list you have. And you can use lots of words to help them get good at it. When they can spell 20 or 30 two-letter words backwards, they're ready for three-letter words. You can also do this for auditory working memory. Over time, not day one, I'm talking a month into this process, give them three letters like ATR and ask them, how could you arrange ATR to form a word? Just one word. And they might eventually say art, A-R-T. Or maybe they say rat, or maybe they say tar. But over time, they'll get good enough to be able to make three words from each of these, but not the first day. Notice the kinds of things we're doing. Rearranging things in your head. That's the core difference between short-term memory and working memory. You have, a, you have a whole list in your notes of, of strategies that you can use in the classroom for it. Here's a resource for you for working memory, a resource. Go to my website, jensenlearning.com, backslash working memory, and there's about 40 slides that will help you build up your skills in teaching working memory. Now, once you've done that, you might say, is there an easier way? Well, first of all, you have to understand how the brain actually rewires itself. Number one, students have to what? they got to buy into it. Number two, the skills have to be coherent. Three, they have to keep increasing the complexity, the challenge in complexity. They need a quick, fast initial learning curve so it starts easy. Their brains need error correction. Students need 10 to 15 minutes a day if they're doing this, this with partners, and if they're doing it on a computer-based program, they'll need between a half hour and an hour a day. Once they get it right, they still need practice. And they can build skills in working memory, in which subject area, the truth is, in any subject area. So notice what we're after. We want to build core cognitive capacity skills. And the ones that matter the most are working memory out of these. All of them are important. If you want to use a software system, most software systems that you can buy online help you get good at exactly what you're practicing online, such as squares, triangles, remembering where the hopscotch pattern was. That's what they do. They're good at it, that. But there's not much transfer to school. So boring or bad software programs are worse than none at all. Go for ones with a proven track record. So I don't support or endorse most programs, but I love the Fast Forward program, which is an option for you because it builds phonological processing, vocabulary, reading skills, and working memory. So these are the highly effective skills that you can teach to help kids get better and out of those, the Fast Forward program is building the reading skills, the vocabulary, and the working memory. So that's a nice uh, solution, getting three out of ten. Now, we've introduced building cognitive capacity in struggling students. Once you've got relationships built, you went after the real problem, you built the mindset. Now you want to teach the core emotional skills. Why is that? because you and I know that cognitive and emotional skills are all related. That means you're going to build social skills, emotional skills, and the last one, which are skills of self-concept. Sometimes teachers will say to a student things like, hey, stop acting out in class or stop doing this. One problem you're going to run across is a lot of students don't know what to do differently. They don't know the behavior that you want. So, First of all, don't assume that the student knows how to behave and they're just trying to irritate you. The piano keyboard is up at the top of the screen for a good reason. If a student had as many possible responses as there are keys on a keyboard, only five of those are hardwired. Only five of them are built in. Everything else has to be taught. So if they don't respond the way you want when they're being disciplined, 
Teach the blue box skills. That's a core understanding. When you do that, you're going to get students that behave differently. You'll also want to know how do you build hope in your students. These are the emotional skills that are going to help them respond better cognitively. That means number one, as we said before, more supportive relationships. You want to build skill building so that they see hope in their own future. Share with them positive role models, which we introduce. Affirmations by authorities, that's you. Setting and getting goals, that's you. Higher expectations. Show them that they're getting better. Cultural reinforcement of hope. Faith in pictures of those who've made it just like them. Creating a new identity, like calling them scholars and helping others through service work. So you've started to foster hope. So how are we going to get that long-haul grittiness so they don't give up on you? Well, we've all heard of this notion of having grittiness, like true grit from the old John Wayne movie, but there are ways you can build it. For one, you can reframe tasks. Sixth graders either did or did not receive a 10-minute intervention. Here's what the inter intervention did. It said, this task difficulty is typical that you're experiencing. It's part of learning. Lots of things are hard in learning. When it's hard, that's a good thing. The group that did not get that intervention did worse, and the group that got it did better. So reframing tasks is critical. So some students may struggle on you. How do you respond? Check out what's up on the screen. When students struggle, which of these four items do you do? Go ahead, begin, read them over, and make a selection. Time's up. By the way, some teachers would have chosen B, C, or D. The best answer, according to research, is A. Give them a pep, pep talk. We're all in this for the long haul. It was just a glitch. Let's change our strategy. So that's part of what grit does, is you say, yep, we're going to have bad things happen. So one teacher that's a real strong, high-performing teacher, when his kids lose energy, when they drop off, he brings out props. One's a raw egg and the other's a super ball, the type of those super compressed rubber balls that bounce really high when you drop them on the floor. And when his students feel depressed and discouraged, he says to them, he says, so who are you? Are you an egg or a super ball? He says, if you drop an egg, it goes splat on the floor and it's broken. But if you drop a super ball, it bounces right back. And the kids are like, huh? What do you mean? And he says, seriously, are you going to let this setback, are you going to let this failure define who you are? Are you going to let it turn you into someone who loses track of who you really are? And so just showing the props gets their attention. But they really pay attention when he says, all right, one more time, are you an egg or not? And he drops the egg on the floor and everybody gasps because it makes a big mess. Then he drops the Super Bowl and he says, so which one are you? And they all shout out, Super Bowl! Now you might think it's kind of silly, but the bottom line is props work. Setting up a contrast works. So how do you actually teach grittiness? Dr. Angela Duckworth, who is one of the premier experts in it, will tell you, first create a common vocabulary for it. When students are showing grittiness, point it out. Doing that shows me a lot of grit. Give them opportunities for long-term work. Reinforce it by saying, I love that grittiness you're showing. Tell stories of grittiness in action, like things you did where you kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and you finally did it. And use reflection to tie in their values whenever grit drops. Those can be done with a simple writing assignment, like what are you good at? What are your values? When they've done that, students show demonstrable new renewed energy, and their performance goes up. So... How else 
can we help your students who are struggling be a coach for life skills? We've introduced the power of emotions and grittiness, but the coaching for life is the one last thing before we finish up today. And for coaching for life, that means you want to help them be a success as a human being. Part of that is what's really blocking them, not just the cognitive skills. So you can focus on gratitude with them. So have them start a gratitude journal. You can post up reminders on the wall to be grateful. You can have them write a letter of gratitude to someone who's been kind to them. Be sure to have, remind your students to say thank you at least seven times a day. And notice things you take for granted in being grateful for the obvious things. You can also build with your students optimism. Optimism, like for example, set gutsy high goals and mini goals to help students keep in mind what's important. <laughs> Excuse me. Remember, you always have a choice. That's optimistic. You're not stuck where you're at. Feed your brain positives with laughter and movement and fun. Stay busy in service of others, doing good things for others. Focus your positives on what you have the most control over, your health, your actions, your thoughts and extend those positive moments and share them often. How do you extend them? Relive them, share them with others. Teach students how to become better at setting goals is a real powerful tool. So start with big goals, what would you like to do, learn or make or build someday? This gives your students the long-term hope. Once they have a big goal, help them set weekly micro goals that'll help them get there. For example, a student may say, I want to play music and get famous. You might say, great. Let's use the next three months to try out three different instruments to see which one you like most. Or this week, have a conversation with the music teacher. In other words, both of those are important, the big stuff and the little stuff. So getting changes to happen in your students can be hard. We've got struggling students and we've mentioned build relationships, go after the real problem, build mindsets, cognitive capacity builders, emotional skills, grit building, and life skills coaching. So it's now time for transfer time. So what are some of your options that you have? Well, next up, I want you to consider the following. In-school resource that's going to foster learning, reading, and memory, and that would include the fast forward program from scientific learning. That I always give my endorsement to. You might consider my free monthly newsletter or workshops that I have, and those you'll be able to find at our website. So action steps. One of the action steps is to consider, does your school have built in something that can automatically start serving your students who are struggling? If they have that already, is it getting the results you want? If not, you might consider a free trial offer through Fast Forward and go to scilearn.com and sign up for a free trial software offer. It's a free thing that students can start getting better on the spot right at their school. You can't go wrong with something that's good and it's free. So that gets my two thumbs up endorsement. Other choices include my summer trainings, or in addition to them, I offer trainings for teachers, for leadership, as well as for those that are interested in learning more about the brain. So our seven secrets for success. My question, out of these seven, what stuck out for you? What was your favorite ABC idea? And what are you going to save and use? We have one last important thing to do before we finish up, so stay with us just for a moment and jot down your favorite idea from those seven items. I'll put those back up on the screen. Jot down your favorite idea from the seven. So stay with us for just a moment. Go ahead, jot down one or two ideas. What was your favorite one? We have one quick last thing I want to do. 
Beautiful. Now that you jotted that down, I said I was going to ask you for your favorite idea, which I just did. Now for the million-dollar poll question, which is, did we do any good today? So could you please go back to this right here is our poll for the moment. Do you feel just as overwhelmed as before? Do you feel a little bit better? You've got some ideas? Or do you feel pretty energized? Go ahead and check the box with your cursor. Go ahead, begin. We want to find out. Well, personally, I'd love to get some feedback. That's really the bottom line. Go ahead, check the circle or box. Five more seconds, four, three, two, and one. Looks like we're making some progress today. We like that. We went from 39% on the overwhelm down to less than 2.5%, so that's pretty good. We like that. Green is good in the middle, so we're happy with that. Appreciate the feedback. And finally, if you're interested in getting today's webinar as a PDF, I'm going to post this up within an hour or so. It should be posted already, but I'll post it up. I'll double check our site. So write this down, jensenlearning.com backslash S-C-I-L-N-O-V for November. So I'll make sure this is up within just a few moments, and we should all be good to go, and you'll be able to get this as a PDF. I hope you enjoyed it. Now it's time for Q&A. We have just a couple of quick moments for that, so if you could jot those down, type them right in. Carrie will be handling that. So Carrie, you ready to jump in? I am ready. So thank you so much for everyone's participation. I have been busy answering uh, messages throughout the session today. This is just wonderful. A lot of people wrote in uh, just in the last few minutes about relationships and how important they are. So um, definitely that, that's probably the answer <laughs> recently that's been the most popular. Uh, just a few questions before we wrap up today. Um, we are, again, um, we have resources at the bottom of the screen for you. I just want to make sure everybody is aware of those. So you can get also the presentation PDF slides in your resources widget in the green icon at the bottom of your screen. I also have a link to Dr. Johnson's website, his working memory page. Um, I also put in an information about our Fast Forward free trial um, sign up. So feel free to, to take a look at that as well. So those are some of the resources. Um, feel free to fill out our webinar survey. We definitely love to hear what people think about the webinars. Feel free to suggest future topics, whatever you liked or didn't like. And then again, if this, if some people are telling me that the certificate may not be working. So if you have trouble with that, please email me at webinars at scilearn.com. But it looks like it's popped up, so the green light should be go. You should be able to click that on and make something happen there. Um, so the first question, Dr. Jensen, is what would you recommend for middle school students that might be different than for elementary to get them motivated? So for middle school, I like the book uh, Turnaround Tools. Turnaround Tools. I wrote that book with uh, Carol Snyder. So the author is myself, Jensen and Snyder. So Turnaround Tools for the Teenage Brain. So you might enjoy mm -hmm. that as a resource, and I'm sure there's many, many other good ones. Other Great. Questions? Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question we get, we got today is, how do you see the effectiveness of using technology and applied arts for dyslexic students? Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, let's see. Um, it depends on how broad the question is. Are, if they're asking whether the Fast Forward program works with students who have been diagnosed with dyslexia, yes, it does. It's very good with it. So I, I think maybe that's question, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, I think it was, actually, because I've been talking to that person a little bit. Um, and then what are some good resources for teaching my students about their own cognitive capacity? Wow, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I um, you can every now, now and then, that I could be. yeah, I know. Every now, now and then, somebody writes a good book for students on the brain, and then it disappears. So, 
that's a book I should write. Not that I have a lot of free time, but that's a book I should write for students on, like how mm-hmm. how much room to grow does your brain have? So mm. I'll put it on my to do list. You know what? I'd go to Amazon and write down. I would Google the phrase "learn about my brain" or a kids book kids brain book on Amazon, and let's find out what's already there first. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, so in a few years, we'll, we'll look for your next book. Then. Yes. Hey, listen, <laughs> a couple of people typed in notes about the, uh, about the URLs that I gave them. I'm going to double check on both of them, but Jensen Learning, spelled J-E-N-S-E-N, learning.com backslash working memory, one long word, should be good. If it's not, I'll make sure it gets straight, straightened out. So give me a couple minutes for that. And the other mm-hmm. one was jensenlearning.com backslash S-C-I-L-N-O-V. I'll make sure that works. So if you didn't immediately get it, be patient. I'll make sure I get it right, okay? Yep, perfect, perfect, perfect. And let's see here. So someone's asking for the name, name of the book and the turnaround time. I, I would say give you a couple of years on that to get that done. Uh, Let's see here. And that is, I think that's all we really have time for today. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Jensen for being here with us again today. If you have any additional questions or concerns, feel free to email me at webinars at scilearn.com. A couple of really important tidbits here. We are recording the session. We We have recorded the session. You can definitely, we will email you hopefully by end of day tomorrow um, that you will get resources uh, to, you'll get the link to the recording, link to a certificate, link to um, the presentation, PDF slides, all of the resources, you'll get those. Um, The recording link is actually going to be available to you this afternoon. You can actually click back on this link that you've used to join the session and you can actually get in here again. So again, any follow-up, we got lots and lots of feedback. Love People are just writing in a lot of great messages. Really appreciate you all being here today. Again, huge thanks to Dr. Jensen. Really appreciate you giving us this time today. Thank you, thank you. And it's been my pleasure. So thank you to everyone who invested the time to uh, join us. And as I said, if they have any questions, just email you, Carrie, and if if there's any that yep. they need to forward to me, I've, uh, you'll do that so everyone will get their questions answered. Like, do not give up. Yes, yes, perfect, exactly, exactly. So if email me and, and then I'll email Dr. Jensen. If there's any issues, please keep on us until we get you your answer. And again, I want to thank you all for joining us today and um, have a great rest of your Wednesday. So thank you so much, and hopefully we'll see you again online soon. Okay, this concludes our webinar today. Thank you. Bye-bye.